preference is key. And there's actually two guys, two very, very, very smart guys, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead, who derived a book. They wrote a book. And it's not a fun book to read. I've heard it compared to, it's as about as interesting as reading the treads on a tire. Um, so it's not interesting at all. But that, that book was called Principia Mathematica. And Douglas Hofstadter will talk about this book a lot. And in this book, they develop a system. They develop exactly that perfect language that you speak of. Um, and the basic idea is that, and, what, and if we want to formulate what you're thinking, is that we, we create a level language L1. And we only allow certain terms. So we create kind of a, a bag of terms, like, you know, in certain sentences in L1, it would be like, the sky is blue, et cetera, and snow is white. These are perfectly like upstanding citizen sentences, right? They never break the law. Um, but then what we do is we prevent certain terms. We, we prevent these sentences from talking about themselves. But whenever we are in this class and we're talking about those sentences, we're actually speaking in another language, L2. And L2 contains L1 as a subset. Um, and then we can start saying things like, um, the sentence, snow is white, is white. And let me do that, yeah. So suddenly I've got the sentence, snow is white, which belongs in L1, and I'm talking about it. But that's only something I can talk about in L2, because you have to, in order to talk about something, you can't talk about yourself. You have to leap outside of it, and then in order to refer to it, you have to stand from somewhere else, right? It's just like you can't really see yourself until you know you use something else to look at yourself. Um, so they developed the system, but even this had flaws. And what Gödel did was he actually used Principia Mathematica, um, and he he took. A statement similar to this, but in fact much more clever in order to prove his, his incompleteness theorem. And it's this. This statement is not provable. And we can specify in what system. And one of the things we'll talk about is in PM, which means Principia Mathematica. But we could say this statement is not provable in number theory. But the bottom line is, what does this statement say? It's not like this statement, because what happens if this statement's false? Well, if it's false, then whatever it says is about itself is not true. So that means it's provable. So if we say it's false, then that means it is provable. But if there's one thing which we are certain of, yes, go ahead. It's like truthness in this case, like if, when you're like proving, since it's like a complete uh, system, yeah. the same is true, the same thing as saying it's provable. Careful. That only goes in one direction. So it is certainly true that a sentence. It, Okay, sorry. Um, what's your name again? Uh, Latif. How do you say it? Latif. Latif? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things Latif said was that in this, in this case, are we, are we saying that when we're doing a derivation, when we have something which is provable, we know it's true, but, and also vice versa. But what I'm cautioning against is that's only true in one direction. So we certainly know that things which are provable are true, if we can prove it, if I can say, I can prove to you that this is so, then it automatically is so. If there's, and this is why people put so much trust in mathematics, is that the second we have a proof of something, we know it's true. But what we just were asking about was what about the other way? Does true always imply provable? And well, let's ask. Let's ask this statement. What if this statement is true? Well, if it's true, 
what it says about itself must be true, and that's that it's not provable. So the only way that this statement is true is if it's not provable. So suddenly, we know that we can't go the other way. And the trick that Gödel used, and this is why we say, this is why we get to the star question, is that this is not a, a statement in mathematics, but what Gödel did is he essentially took a statement like this and he said, well, we're going to let every letter and logical symbol stand for a number. So I'm going to let P be, you know, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, or 1, 0. And we're going to give a unique number to every symbol and including spaces. And then once we have this, we have a girdle number for this statement. And then what we can start doing is we can start giving certain operations. Remember when we were doing MIU, and we're saying, well, what we can always do is we can, if we have three I's, we can cancel it. And, or if we have something, a string of hyphens or whatever, or a string of letters after M, we can double it. So what Girdle did is he turned each of these in, rules of inference into rules of arithmetic. So, and I'm going to go ahead and hop over here. So what he did is he made rules of inference and he made them equivalent to, or my special isomorphism symbol, to rules of arithmetic. So this is kind of counterintuitive um, and I can't go into all the details, um, but we will meet them in chapter 9. Um, and that's the idea that, so suppose we have a logical, logical thing like, well, we have the statement P, and then we also have the statement that P implies Q. So we know that the, the statement, if P is true, so if it is cloudy, then it's going to rain. And then if we have, well, I'm looking outside and it's cloudy, then we can immediately, re this is equal to Q. Right? So if we know that if it's cloudy, then it will rain is true, and we have that it's, cl it's cloudy, then we can immediately deduce that it's going to rain. And what Gödel did is he said, well, these statements I can actually make into numbers, um, and I can make the logical symbol and into an operation, like addition, and I can make implies, well, this would also be a symbol and I can have this total operation of detachment, of pulling out Q, into a statement almost like 1 plus 1 equals 2. Um, except it then becomes, and then what he did is he captured the idea of provability into a property of numbers, like prime, something being prime. So then, really what this, this statement comes down to is like, is something such and such number, the number which codes for this statement, does not have a property. And that's why you need something as strong as number theory in order to do this numbering trick. But that's just kind of a first glance at Gödel's theorem, and I don't want to go into too much detail about it. However, I do want to go back and talk a little bit more about the, uh, the things which we mentioned and we kind of glanced upon in chapter four. And that was the, uh, kind of the ideas of geometry. And this is, this is really cool, and it has something to do with, uh, with interpretation. Now, I want you all to kind of remember what, what we mean by interpretation. And it's, I think it's a term I kind of briefly defined um, on the first day of lecture. For those of you who are here, can anyone kind of tell me what interpretation is about? Go ahead. Um, sort of like, 